Well, that doesn't as well. You are expected to. Okay. All right, Jay, whenever you're ready. Okay. So our group, uh, we're doing a project on solar pasteurization. Uh, Andrew, J myself, and Yusuf. Uh, could you go to the next slide? So uh, the, the first thing we researched was what type of solar cookers already exist. And we found that a few different categories of cookers existed. There's the box cooker, the panel cooker, concentrators, and cylinders. And most of what we saw fall into one or more than one of these categories. Um, and then these, all these solar cookers, as they're designed, um, they're, the design of them, uh, the thought that went into them was to try to increase the solar input power, to decrease the mass of the water, to begin with a higher initial temperature, or to decrease the heat loss. So those are four design parameters. Could you go to the next slide? Thanks. So I'm um, going into the design of each type a little bit more. The box cooker on the top left um, has the boost reflector and an insulation around the box. Um, the idea of this is to have a simple design, simple geometry that can increase the heat going in and maintain it. The next type is the panel cookers. It's a little bit different. It maximizes the reflection, um, but it doesn't have as much insulation. It might have a little bit more uh, tracking to the sun you have to do throughout the day. The third design is the bottom left picture. It's the concentrators where all of the heat um, is coming from a wide area and being ref reflected to a single focal point. Um, this one has to track the sun quite a bit more. So that's a, a con with it, but that's just another design you'll see. And the last design we saw is cylinders where um, it's the bottom right picture where you have an array of a whole bunch of cylinders that contain a smaller amount of water. So it heats faster because there's less water to heat. Okay, next slide. Thanks. Um, as they're designing, um, they e each method has a different uh, practical use. So some are meant to heat water and some food, um, sometimes other things. Um, the quantity, if you're to targeting an audience for a hiker or a small family versus uh, industrial or a village size, um, you'll design it differently. Some designs work better than others. And then cost and complexity, and there's many more other things. Uh, just a note on complexity, um, it's more than just having a complex design. It's also how much maintenance does it take? Um, how much calibrating does it take, like tracking the sun? Um, and there's, there's just a lot of other things, different products think for. So the idea is we want to know who we're targeting to have the most success because targeting everything isn't the best choice. Okay, next slide. Um, so here's some examples online I found. This is stuff you could buy um, off the internet, off Amazon mostly. But the first one I picked is, it's kind of a different one. This is a, uses the cylinder design. It's the one that says four, uh, 40 gallons on it. And it's a water heater for a home. So it heats a larger amount of water. It heats it, it has a pump to take the water out um, and pump it through the house and to pump colder water back in once it's done being heated. So that one's less about um, sanitation and more about just heating it. And then uh, we've seen both of these other pictures before, but it, you can see the, the panel cooker or the concentrator designs in both of those solar cookers. Okay, next slide. Certainly, the present challenges that are facing this field, we can kind of divide these into three categories. The first being technological challenges. So we all know that the sun doesn't always shine, um, but people will always need water. Uh, regardless of what the weather is like. And so designing for optimal conditions and optimizing for optimal conditions isn't always the best way to go. 
really you actually want to look for maybe subpar conditions and try to meet minimum requirements there because that's sort of going to be your worst case scenario or at least one of the worst cases and so if you can achieve you know proper pasteurization under those conditions it's likely that you can also do so at ideal conditions the next question that you have to think about are the heat transfer materials that you're going to be using right once you collect this heat from the sun how do you actually transfer it to the water for pasteurization or if you're going to put food in there how would you do that uh, and so we kind of think about what the cost versus benefit is, right? We could develop these very exotic materials made of very um, complex structures that can focus and channel thermal energy. But is this something that's going to be cheap to make? Is it something that can be repairable? And are there contamination or toxicity concerns? Oftentimes in rural areas, uh, there's often mining. And so in the water supply itself, there's often heavy metals and other things. And from our own experience with tap water and such, we know that these often dissolve out and form kind of a scale. So if you start putting you know, high volumes of water through this over a long period of time, how are you going to manage the scale? Is it going to corrode the materials that are being used? Are you going to have to do um, uh, intermittent like acidic washes of the system? And how are you going to make sure that that acid or that cleaning solution is available? Next thing we have to think about is low water yield. Most of these systems, especially these smaller ones, don't yield that much water, which for maybe an American family where our fertility rates about like 1.8 may not be that big of an issue, you might actually be able to get enough water for that. But in the country of Niger, the fertility rate is uh, over six. Uh, now, you know, we can factor in how many of those children actually survive, and maybe it is due to the lack of water, but with larger family sizes, uh, more children, more mouths to feed, more people drinking water, you're going to have to think about how much water your system actually yields and whether it's proper and appropriate to that family size. The last thing we have to think about is system portability. If this is something that's going to be installed in a village as a large installation, portability is more or less based on if it can be fit into a vehicle. If this is something for more rural or a backpacking scenario, you want it to be able to be foldable or at least light enough so that it can fit in a pack. It can't be something that's going to have to be kind of lugged around. The next uh, challenges that we think about are logistical. So being able to deploy these devices in remote areas, this kind of goes back to that portability concern. Can you actually transport it there and deploy it in a, in a way that makes sense, in a way that makes it useful? You also have to think about infield repairs and maintenance. Um, if we use really exotic materials or technologies that are quite sophisticated, if they break, are there going to be the tools and the experience on hand to replace those? Or is it going to be a situation where you have to call a customer service and then wait for a representative to get back to you in three or four weeks? Uh, it makes it kind of challenging and, and it's something that also needs to be considered. The next thing is, depending on who your you know, target audience is, right? If this is a hiker versus or if this is meant to address um, you know, villages and remote areas, you have to think about marketing, right? If it's a hiker, you're going to be targeting a specific you know, audience. You want to appeal to them. But if it's trying to target rural villages or areas that are more impoverished, odds are they aren't going to be the ones that are actually buying the device. Rather, it's going to be NGOs or the UN that's buying and supplying this. So you have to think about how you're marketing it so you actually make an impact. Because if no one buys it, it's not actually going to be used and you're not going to be profitable in any sense. The last thing we have to think about are cultural and local challenges. So population education makes a big difference. If the population doesn't understand the risk of contaminated water or the idea that there are various microorganisms and viruses and bacteria in there that can harm them, they probably won't see the utility of a device and they're probably unlikely to actually use it. So there has to be some period of education to make them understand the importance of this particular device. The other challenge is local involvement. Uh, in Kenya, they installed a large water pasteurization system. And they found that after three years, it had completely fallen apart and it wasn't being used. This was largely due to a lack of infrastructure to actually support the device and a lack of local involvement. Locals weren't involved in the planning of where to place it, where to install it, nor trained on how to operate and use it continuously. And so when things got challenging, whether there were uh, climatic disasters or just other things that distracted them from using it, it just fell into a state of repair. So making it so that locals are involved in the process and can provide feedback is also necessary. Now let's let's take a look at the pros and cons of some some products, some existing products. So we have the solar cooker, 
and uh, and we have the solar cooker and we have the thermal uh, pasteurization system. So the the for the solar cooker, uh, first it's easy to make. So there are like a lot of DIYs uh, projects. So you can like watch online and make your own solar cooker, and it's uh, it's also cheap. Like you can make them from like cheap materials. And uh, they don't they don't require a lot of maintenance. So once you make it, once you made it, like it's like they like they don't have they don't require like a lot of adjustment. But uh, for convenient, it requires a lot of, like user adjustments to capture like uh, the uh, the most uh, the mo uh, like uh, a large amount of uh, sunlight. And also, it requires a temperature uh, requires a temperature indicator to tell you if the water is is safe to uh, to drink. Uh, also, we have the solar th uh, thermal pasteurization system, and this is this is a good example for like villages and uh, remote areas because it's easy to use. It's automated, uh, and we and Jared also talked about it. And like it, you can install it in, in your home and stuff. It it also asked. Uh, uh, pasteurizes uh, a large amount of water, and this is uh, as well good for like remote areas. And it also has uh, storage, and it requires low maintenance. But the the main disadvantage is, is like high cost. Uh, it depends on the size of the system. Uh, it, it varies from like a system to like a huge uh, uh, pasteurization uh, plant. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, let's see. Okay. Uh, one thing which is, uh, I would like to see is what are the, the existing solutions in terms of what companies are doing, like what the technology can. I mean, I assume you have that. Can you tell us a little bit about like, what is the existing solutions out there, whether it's large scale or small or small scale? Yeah, a lot of the systems today use what's called batch processing where they actually will just fill a container with water and then they will put it in some sort of solar concentrated device and the idea is that eventually that large batch will be uh, fully fully pasteurized over at time at what scale at what scale uh, it, talking about villages it typically depends yeah it, it, so it will depend on like what the scale is there's interest in uh, pushing for modularity so that you can improve and scale up depending on uh, what your target size is so oftentimes they'll use a tubular structure um, that is oriented towards the sun and you can move it. Uh, and the advantage of that is that you can just continually add successive tubes in order to improve that. But the problem with the batch system is that differences in thermal gradients will mean that the water near the surface or that's directly <coughs> exposed to the sun will probably get heated at a faster rate uh, than the water near the bottom. And it's unknown whether the water at the bottom will actually uh, be fully processed. The other problem is that once you heat up the water, uh, you don't really you don't necessarily need that heat where you don't really use it. You typically just cool the water back down and then you can drink it. But the idea is to actually use a flow system so that when you add new water, you can use the heat from the old water to create uh, an initial heating of that water that you just added. And it makes the subsequent pasteurization much faster. So, so well, one thing you didn't talk about is how do you know if it's actually pasteurized? Like, do you do Sure, yeah. I mean, most of the time they use the waxes as we talked about, but there's also some metal uh, metals that under a certain temperature will undergo a strain. And so they will use that to monitor as well. But the wax solution seems to be pretty adequate um, and, and one of the most like, low technology, like low technologically available solutions out there. So one thing you did point out, which is actually important to all of you, is, is um, not at this stage, but in the next, probably the next stage, of the third presentation you did, but after the second presentation, you have to kind of decide okay, what, who is going to be the customer, because that will drive the technical solution. Like, like, is it actually a village, or is it a house, or is it a high school? So there are, there are all different solutions. So that's an important point, and that's the thing that this is actually the point how you present the challenge. So, um, if I were to um, ask about, if you were to rank the top uh, four D challenges, which you're going to have to do in the next presentation, what are you looking towards to address? Probably low water yields and heat transfer. 
materials because it is that kind of trade off where um, there are these great new field called meta materials and they can concentrate thermal gradients quite well, but they're very expensive. So it's a question of how do you uh, order, like, walk the line between practicality and efficiency, and you're going to have some sort of trade off there. Uh, you did mention the problem with the scale, which I thought was interesting, but seemed like an important problem to solve. And uh, one quick thought I had was maybe I don't know if you can think about mocking up a little modularity to replace the fact that you would change my maybe like you would say, you need some corrosive material or something. Yeah. Maybe it's not safe. Anyway. Um, the, the other thing you didn't talk about is potential applications in disasters, which doesn't mean to be like an NGO, it can be like the federal government, like FEMA, things like that. So it's something to also think about. Um, um, anyone else have any questions or comments? I think we're almost out of time. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Great, thank you. Thanks. So whoever is going on next.